Hey, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the Franchise Edge podcast brought to you by us at Scorpion. I'm your host, Jamie Adams. Now, I know that there are no shortage of podcasts to listen to today, franchise or otherwise. The purpose of this podcast is really to focus on marketing and sales. And we're going to be talking with executives from different franchisors and franchisees and other people from the industry who play a role in helping franchise brands and their franchisees market their their business and and sell their products and services. I'm really excited about the first episode. I really I actually focused on someone that I've had a relationship with for a really long time in the franchise space, and that person is Meg Roberts. Meg Roberts is the president of the Lash Lounge, which is part of the Franworth family of brands. I've known Meg since uh, she worked at Service Brands International uh, way back around 2007 or 2008. So she started in franchising on the franchise or side right around the same time that I got started cutting my teeth uh, personally on the franchise supplier side of the house. Um, Meg worked at Service Brands International up to the point where they were acquired by Neighborly, then the Dwyer Group, who then became Neighborly. She stayed on there for a couple of years and has been with Franworth for the last several Um, Funny story about Meg, my first ever face-to-face meeting with Meg. um, I'd worked with her for a couple of years at that point. We had never met. And we met one time in Ann Arbor at their office at Service Brands. And I made the mistake of wearing jeans and a sport coat, not slacks or a suit. And the first thing Meg said to me was she looked at me and she said, what, I'm not important enough for you to dress up? I remember that today. Um, Fortunately, she didn't hold it against me. We've had a great relationship. She was a customer for a really long time. I have a tremendous amount of respect for her. And we had a great conversation. And I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you enjoy the podcast. Continue to come back, subscribe. And we look forward to interacting with you. Have a great day. Well, hey, well, I want to dive right in. I, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, so right now, I know you're currently president CEO of the Lash Lounge. Uh, you've been part of the Franworth uh, brand of families for a couple of years, or, or family of brands rather, for a couple of years now. Um, I want to take you a little bit further back, though, and talk a oh, little God. bit about your marketing experience. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, so we're going to kind of start further back, and then we'll work our way towards more present times, if that's okay, okay. with you. So, so one of the things that I found really fascinating is you got your you got your career started in in marketing and advertising primarily through TV and broadcast. That's correct. What was it like making that transition from kind of the agency side to your first experience client side when you joined Service Brands International and Molly Made back in 2007 or so? Yeah, I I love that question, Jamie, because I spent, you know, all of my academic career and postgrad focused on sort of traditional marketing and consumer packaged goods, big agency stuff, you know, where you're so excited to get your first job and your budgets are $60 million. And that's a thrill for a young person in that industry. And it's absolutely um, a terrific industry. I loved spending time there. And after making a choice to move to a smaller community um, to raise my family, I kind of stumbled into franchising. And I'll tell you um, what I love about it most today is what humbled me at the beginning, at the very beginning of my career transitioning over into Molly Maid at the time, um, privately owned by David McKinnon and his family, I was just learning about franchising. I didn't really have any idea even what that meant. I was, I was ignorant and naive about how small business owners succeeded. And I remember thinking, gosh, they're only spending this much. You know, they're writing these small checks um, to do Valpac and mailers and local pay-per-click, which I was doing with you at the time. And I didn't have the rooted respect for the courage it takes for a small business owner to make those decisions. So it was a it was a very fast transition. It only takes one or two times to recognize that you are not being respectful to somebody's big decisions, big choices, big checks that they're writing from their personal checking account. And, you know, I made one of those mistakes early on, um, maybe in the first couple months of my career at Molly Maid, and recognized pretty quickly the difference between what I was doing then and even now today uh, versus my original foray in my career. And it's so much more personal. Um, It's so much more important, I think, the type of advice that we give and the direction that we provide and the mutual respect that's required in this industry because we're all in it together. 
nobody succeeds alone and nobody should fail alone. So yeah, it was, um, it was a hard learning curve, but a pretty hard impact at the very beginning. And then, um, a real awakening for something that has become, uh, my absolute passion. And that's, that's this industry and, and feeling like you can directly impact somebody's, uh, likelihood of success in marketing and, um, you know, through franchising in general. Was there a moment you mentioned that learning curve and you mentioned kind of a, a moment where you, it, it hits you that, you are now working with these small business owners and that these, you know, what you would have seen as big or small checks from your previous life were in fact bigger checks for the small business owner. Was there, was there a moment or was there a specific learning experience that really yeah. taught you yeah, that? Yeah, there was, was there it, was okay. a, there was a specific uh, franchisee on the, in the Molly made organization who was part of our national marketing committee at the time. And I was the director or VP, I don't know. Um, talking about the national marketing investment. And I think I said in a meeting, look, you know, we're the ones investing the lion's share of the money. You guys need to be doing your part. And I, and it was two things. I said, you guys, which I'll never forget because it separated us. It, it made it sound like it was us versus them. And that was the, that was the awakening for me. There is no us and them. It's we. So I said, you guys. And then I said, doing your part. And I was very um, gently reminded uh, by a particular franchisee in the room who was on the committee and is a dear friend of mine today and has been for 16 years. But he was really um, polite, but concise in letting me know, hey, Meg, you know, these are significant dollars that individuals are writing. And I think he may have said, you know, when was the last time you wrote a $12,000 check for a stack of paper? And I'm like, okay, you know what? Your point is made because that stack of paper is coupons that are going in a mailbox. And, and that was within the first 90 days of, uh, of my career there. in I don't know, 2006 or 2007, I'm not even sure when, and it changed everything for me. So um, it's it's good to be humbled and reminded, and it's always nice when someone does it politely and uh, with intention to help you. Yeah, that that's awesome. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of times mailers, Valpac. Yeah. So one of the other really th- interesting things about that period of time, so 2006, 2007, was I feel like that was the time when when Google really started to become a thing um, as a, a good marketing vehicle for the local business owner. It, yep. it was really starting to form and take the shape of replacing yellow pages. But at the time, it's easy to say that looking back, right? But at the time, I would imagine as a, as a director, as someone new to the franchising space, that you were probably pretty key in kind of introducing this concept of Google and pay-per-click to a network like like Molly made, what what was that like at the time? I know like looking back, it was like no brainer, right? Of course we did Google, but I got to imagine like that that had to have been a pretty big, bold move to really push that. So tell me, tell me about that time. I think, well, I think it was, um, it was definitely a, a bold move. It was definitely one of those challenges that you run up against because you're trying to educate your partners and your community on the other avenues in which they need to invest. And they're already feeling this pressure of, hey, we're investing all these money, all this money in the things you've told us for the past 15 years. You just introduced this new thing that we don't understand. And is it additional money or are we cutting back someplace? So I think there were, you know, two things. One was the responsibility of the franchisor to think um, appropriately about where a franchisee could pot- potentially carve back what was their traditional investment in order to address this new and, you know, more uh, cutting edge, I guess is what it was at that time, new way to potentially advertise. We actually talked about Google as the digital yellow pages then, Jamie. I mean, we were trying to educate people on the basic tenets of search engine optimization, which were three words no one had heard before. So it was a, it was a heavy lift um, from an education standpoint uh, from an investment standpoint, and I think really importantly from a distinguishing uh, the franchisor responsibility in creating the destination and the website and the user experience that would provide the avenue for the local franchisee to appropriately advertise. So all three of those things were really a challenge um, for us. The biggest, um, the biggest win there was our association with a company you were with at the time as well, um, and that was Reach Local because they provided the educational aspect that our franchisees needed 
so much at that time. And, you know, a decade later, there are, of course, you know, many um, great agencies and suppliers that provide that type of support um, to a local franchisee. So that was a big, that was a big differentiator for us. I think we got ahead of that with the right support at the right time. Got it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, Thinking about the 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 support and getting ahead of things, uh, the other thing that I think that that introduced at the time, um, the, the Google movement, if you will, was this idea that uh, you know previous to that there was the the quote I can't remember exactly. I'm going to paraphrase, but it's like I know fifty percent of my marketing and advertising works. I just don't know which fifty percent. <laughs> yeah. And then with Google and and some of the you know tracking that that agencies were able to bring into an advertising mechanism like that, all of a sudden you had a lot more visibility, at least on the Google side of you know, dollar yeah. in, dollar out. At least right. you had a sense of you know how many people were, were clicking on your site and maybe calling the business or scheduling an appointment or, or trying to schedule an appointment online. How did that impact You know, all of a sudden, I know what this advertising is doing, but I'm not quite sure what Valpac or maybe what broadcast or other things are doing. How did you then kind of figure out how much money you should really lean in and spend on Google versus knowing that those other brand marketing and other kind of offline things were still valuable, but they just could be measured the same way. How did you approach those things? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I've had the luxury now of working across different verticals within franchising. So I can absolutely speak to there's there's a different mix. There's a different need based on the type of, of customer that you have. Obviously, in the in the beauty and wellness industry that I'm in today, we don't do discount couponing via mail. It's not where our audience is. We have to spend a lot of time, effort, yeah. energy, and money in social media because we're a very visual brand, right? Our beauty and wellness brands are all about kind of connecting with people's ethos and what they're into. In home services, it's it's quite a bit different and understandably so. People are making decisions about the care of their home, you know, whether it's plumbing, whether it's housekeeping, you know, deck maintenance, et cetera. And they're looking for and expecting to see couponing as well. So how does that dovetail in with digital? Um, the great thing, as you mentioned about digital, is it does give you more attribution, right? A franchisee was able to see, oh, okay, I saw this many clicks. I saw this many forms. That's a really good thing. Um, and it's also challenging because the idea of, I don't know which 50% worked, there's actually something somewhat decent about that because I think real marketers know that everything works together and that we're not looking for that single thread that gets everything done without social media. I don't believe that the Lash Lounge website would be as strong. Without direct mail couponing, I don't believe that the Molly made pay-per-click initiatives would have been as strong. So you know, I'm of course not writing the checks, but our job is to kind of balance and see when one starts to overtake the other, but not with the intention to eliminate one over the other. One other thing I want to make a point about, though, yeah. as far as attribution goes, that digital age really changed for us as marketers. I think it brought into perspective the idea that in marketing, the genesis is to drive the contact is to create the person's interest to pick up the phone, to key in a form, and to try to connect with that business. When you have attribution where you can listen to a call, as a franchisee, you now know, I spent X amount of dollars to have Meg call my franchise. And when she called, the person answered and said, Lash Lounge, how can I help you? Well, that's not marketing. That's operations. Yeah. So it really created yeah. this visibility that both things have to work together because I hate to see people waste marketing dollars that actually worked but failed at the point of conversion. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think that's probably still one of the biggest challenges. Even absolutely, you know, here we are 15 years later from whenever Google and that kind of attribution and tracking became a thing. 15 years later, that's still the break point for yep. a lot of the small business owners is they invest all this money, but then they just think about, you know, that those tweaks that they can make for the people answering the phones or responding to a form and carrying through that experience to make sure that capitalizing on the investment that I'm making to get people to contact my business. So yeah, I'm I mean, glad you brought that first, up. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, it's the first human impression, right? I mean, what you do so expertly well, what Scorpion does in building great websites and creating that user experience, but if it doesn't connect with a good human experience, whether that's a call center or an expert, you know, front desk concierge, someone who is 
engaging with the customer, then you really don't you really don't have the equation figured out. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. And you mentioned something a, a couple minutes ago too. You talked about you know how all great marketers know that everything works together, right? <laughs> so back in the Molly early Molly made days, you're doing direct mail, you're doing digital. You can track digital probably better than direct mail, but you know those things kind of play in hand. Then you mentioned today that with Lash Lounge, right, like your your website probably wouldn't get as much traffic as if it weren't for your social media presence. So again, bridging the gap between you know 2007, the only real digital mechanism was Google. Yeah, and now you've got all of these other channels that you've got to have at least some type of perspective on at minimum. And then oftentimes an actual strategy on. So you've got all your social channels like Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and maybe Snapchat if that's relevant to your business. You've got, you've got Google, which can't be ignored still, right? You've got email marketing, which is now a, a, a bigger, a bigger thing. So how do you, how do you approach all of these different channels and where to spend time and money versus the ones that maybe you just don't have enough resource to really go deep in? How do you think about that today? Yeah, that's a great question, Jamie. I think, um, you know, a franchisee should really be depending on their franchisor to be a great steward of their national ad fund. Um, And not only to be a steward of the dollars, but to hire the right personnel, to hire the right expertise on the franchisor side to really decipher between what's necessary and needed and what's nice to have. So if I'm comparing the two businesses um, that I had the pleasure of leading, I would say uh, Molly Made then and Molly Made today needs to have a social presence. It needs to, but is it totally necessary to be involved in that on a day-to-day basis? I guess I would say I doubt that there are thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands and certainly not millions of people who are engaging daily with daily house cleaning tips. It doesn't mean it's not super important because it is. I would suggest maybe in that business, you're more interested in YouTube where potentially you're showing tips on things people might be searching for and they want to see a visual um, ad for that. Well, the franchisor should take responsibility for that because it's macro and we don't want to distract our franchisees with these macro tasks that would be too much for them. Opposite really is the Lash Lounge where the franchisor has to understand and decipher which of those key media, and in our case, it's all of them that matter, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, we have to be everywhere because our audience is 18 to 84 and they're engaging in social. They're looking for beauty tips. They're buying products online. You know, they're following influencers. That's our industry. We have to be omnipresent everywhere. And our franchisees have to have a small part in that, but a measured part that makes it so that they can achieve an outcome without distracting themselves from the from the daily business. So we try to find partners that help franchisees augment uh, what they can be doing online, but we try to carry the lion's share um, of the of the macro strategy there. You mentioned the NAF, and I would imagine, especially for a brand like the Lash Lounge, where you do really need to have a kind of a full funnel presence. You need to be, yeah. um, you know, leveraging, you know, things like social um, at the top of the funnel, and then you've got to have a presence in search, and you've got to make sure that your website's in good order so that when people find you there, they want to actually book an appointment and get drawn into one of your locations. But when it comes down to the NAF, how do you how do you think about where to leverage those dollars? I would imagine that's got to be pretty complex for a brand like the Lash Lounge. It is um, more complex than uh, than I've certainly ever dealt with um, on other franchise brands, and that really is uh, because of the, re- the reasons I mentioned already. Which is, this is a brand that really needs to be um, everywhere. It's not a nice to have; it's a necessary to have. So, you know, first and foremost, when I consider the responsibility of a national ad fund and or marketing fee, however it's defined uh, by that franchisor's agreement, to me, the priority is always having uh, responsible, intelligent you know, cutting edge staff members who are making shrewd investments on behalf of the franchisee. Dollars spent can be done somewhat recklessly by staff that um, doesn't have experience. Dollars invested happens when you also invest properly in the right type of talent. And at the Lash Lounge, we have an incredible uh, VP, Taylor Hullick-Smith, who has really re-engineered the entire brand since 2018 with a huge emphasis on how the brand looks and who we appeal to 
for a beauty and wellness brand, you have to constantly be demonstrating who you are and showing and, um, you know, creating campaigns and beautiful uh, Canva, Instagram, you name it. And she's way ahead on doing all of that at the same time balancing, you know, kind of what I consider the the tech underbelly of all of the digital pieces with her teammates and Janae and Lauren and Katie and Lindsay and Olivia. She has a full scale team um, with people who have subject matter expertise in the, the core vertical. So to me, it really, the investment in the dollars um, hinges on the investment in the right team. And we most certainly have done that. She continues to build um, a team with just exquisite expertise. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the team because that's one, one area I wanted to pivot around um, because you, you probably more than anybody that I know in franchising kind of exhibited this model of of building and maintaining kind of a core team yeah. around you for a really long time, right? So you've got, you know, you know the, the two people that come to mind for me personally are Brandy Klustra and Megan Conway. Amen. And we all, <laughs> We all miss we all miss Leah, you know, Stewart. I know that she took her, her 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 career in a different direction, but that group of women, you guys have worked together for a really really long time. How do you approach how do you approach that? What are your thoughts on kind of having that core team that kind of moves together, travels together, um stays together, you know, over now, it seems like over well over a decade. How yeah, do you think that um, plays into your ability to execute? Well, you know, I'll tell you the thing it plays into for me personally is a sense of community um, and also a true admiration of the the success that each one of those women has allowed me to have and hopefully that I've helped them achieve as well. The the core ethos of the women that I've worked with for almost 20 years now, many of them, is that we are all ambitious, but we are not competitive with one another. And that really changes your outlook on your professional development. If you have an organization or leadership or, you know, a a stack of individuals who are looking out for how each of them can be more successful without having to step on one another's backs. You know, it's different when you say, hey, stand on my shoulders, let me help you versus someone stepping on your back. I mean, metaphorically speaking, right? It's a it's a very different, um, a very different objective. You know, Brandy and Megan, I've worked with uh, for 15 years at this point. They're both absolutely incredibly talented women in the marketing sphere. Now at the Lash Lounge, we've got 26 females on this team, and it's the same level of integrity and intention in supporting one another. So I don't have a, a lot of exceptional, unique talents. But I do think that I'm able to bring people together and allow and create these opportunities for everyone to succeed. I mean, that's my greatest pleasure in this business from the franchisor side is to create some really incredible career opportunities for the people that I've worked with because it happened to me. You know, people did that for me. And if I can do that for others, then um, then I'm leaving a really good um, leaving a really good track record. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I think it's pretty safe to say that you've 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 done a really fantastic job doing that for others. I mean, it it just goes to show with with the the tribe of people that you've kept with <laughs> you as long as you have all great people. And I love what you said too. They're competitive. Um, they're competitive, but ambitious, or they're ambitious, but, but they're competitive. not competitive. Yeah, yeah, ambitious but not competitive. I I think that's awesome. I try to. I try to surround myself with people in the same way around work. Well, so, I appreciate um, that, Jamie. That's the that's the highest compliment um, that I can that I look for in in my career now. So thank you, um, thank you for that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So you know, another thing you mentioned um, in my in my in my extensive research that I was doing before this conversation, Meg. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I, that you mentioned in another podcast was that the first thing that matters to you is the people on your team employees and owners. And that always comes before how many franchisees do we have, right? How fast our brand has grown. But I would say that because you care about those things, those are the reasons that you guys have seen the growth that you've seen over the last couple of years, even through, you know, the pandemic like COVID, which I'm, I'm sure that may have impacted your net, your new store growth during that couple of years. But the fact that you were able to, I think, I think I read where you 
opened a hundred stores in, in, in under two years. And then, you know, you had to basically close a hundred stores in two years briefly during COVID. Close a hundred stores talk in to like me. two days. <laughs> yeah, two days. That was it. Two oh, days. Sorry. Open them in two years, close them in two close days. Close them in two days. Yeah. Like everybody else. Crazy times. But let's skip that part because everybody talks about COVID and I don't really want to go back let's there. Play, so, yeah, let's um, skip over that. But I do want to think, I do want to talk briefly about how you think, you know, marketing plays a role in franchise development and franchise sales. Surely at a brand like Lash Lounge, right? Part of what they are truly buying is that brand experience, right? They, you said it's a necessity product, you know, not a need product. So how do you feel like, you know, the brand and just specific marketing within kind of the franchise development, franchise sales arena has played a role in the growth of the brand? Yeah, I, I love that question because I think we've evolved quite a bit in the last, well, I call it almost five years that I've um, I've been with the brand at this point. Um, we've evolved a lot in terms of uh, our brand, what we look like, but not who we are. We have always maintained that our brand is about human connection and relationships. People come to invest in how they look and feel and they want to have a connection. It's a beauty and wellness service. So we've been very intentional about marketing our business as one that very much pivots around the attitude of ownership. So we want people who have this, you know, servant's heart, who are interested in career creation for their stylists because they're careers. They are not jobs. These young women are making um, an incredible salary, but that we really understand and respect that the success of our business is built around how we connect with our customers. So I'm all about balancing technology and and using technology to offset administrative things, but we want to connect and we make sure that in our franchise development process, what you see on our franchise development site, what you hear from our franchisees, what you experience as someone who is going through our franchise development process is extremely personal. Like I'm going to come pick you up in my car in the morning and I'm going to bring you over to the office. And there is no time with the CEO. We don't consider ourselves so special that we aren't getting right down with our franchisees to help them understand that the relationship, which is going to begin with us, has to transcend and work in your salon. And I think people are looking for more of that. Certainly services are taking off and a lot of franchise organizations have have boomed, uh, you know, post that two-year period that will remain nameless. And in our business, people really are seeking to connect again. You know, you spend a lot of time at home. You're eager to get back out and be part of your community. You want to be part of a brand that is about human connections. So we've seen that in our results recently. And we want to make sure that that we not just show it and say it, but that we, we act it, you know, that we are there um, connecting, texting, relating with our franchisees on a regular basis. And I think that's appealing uh, to people who are starting a small business. At least um, that's the type of candidate that we look for. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome. And I uh, just pointing out to, I mean, I, I think the the interesting thing you talked about was that, you know, you, your brand is all about human connection and you really want to connect with the owners, the potential owners. So I think it goes back to like, when you think about marketing from a franchise development perspective, yeah, you can invest in making people aware of the opportunity through maybe your franchise development website. Um, but the moment that they choose to actually contact and reach out and want to talk to one of the franchise development reps or franchise salespeople, you have to really enter in just like the the small business answering the phone, right? You got to yeah. enter into creating that experience that you want your owners to have and to think about when they're maybe comparing, do I want to buy into this opportunity versus maybe another concept? Yeah, I, so, I couldn't agree um, more. It's get like that we operational. Can't, we, we can't no, ask our franchisees to do something that we're not doing ourselves because at the end of the day, we're a small business too. I mean, we're a small franchisor at this point. I have you know big dreams of where we're going to go, but we're small. And, and no matter how big we get, we should not remove that personal aspect. So I have a personal phone call with every franchisee candidate before they come to discovery day, not because I'm vetting them, but because I want them to vet me. If they aren't connecting with what I see for the company, then I'm not right for them. Like this is their choice as much as it is mine. So I make an hour, hour and a half in my schedule for any and all candidates. And it's not as though I have that time, but I find it because it's really important to people who are making a big investment like that. So that's our way of differentiating between 
the automation in FranDev and we can chat them back and we can send them through our process. But honestly, ours is a business that requires human connection. So we sure as heck better be willing to make it if we expect that from people who are going to participate. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So I got a couple couple more questions um, and then I'm going to let you get back to enjoying the beautiful weather and the birds. Yeah, I'm going to have like a sunburn um, on the bottom part of my face I can see. I'm trying to like <laughs> dodge and get into the shade here, but I need to be able to see the screen at the same time. So I'll blame a tan chin on you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, okay, so, so you know, you guys are all, all, obviously part of Franworth. Yep. Um, so it's a platform of companies. Just interested um, in how you think about marketing as a shared service across your different brands like how do you think about or how do you all organize the maybe the shared services components of marketing versus the resources that are dedicated to a specific brand how do you how do you all approach that yeah, so that's a great question, Jamie. It's always a good opportunity to kind of explain um, the nature of how Franworth works in partnering with brands to accelerate their growth. And brands have different life stages, right? If they're in the early, early stage, they need a lot more support in those cross-functional uh, departments like marketing, like franchise development, operations, et cetera. As the brand grows, um, using Lash Lounge as an example, the brand needs to start to invest in its own staff, which we've obviously done. And I've talked a little bit about uh, the marketing department within the Lash Lounge specifically. But our newer brands within the beauty division, which is a newly formed uh, division within Franworth, I'm really excited about uh, leading as the CEO. We have two additional brands, uh, Scoa Facials and Sugaring LA, which is an alternative hair removal, um, all natural franchise out of Southern California, when you look at all three of those brands and you recognize, you know, not only do we have the same consumer in mind, but more often than not, we're probably going to have the same type of franchise candidate who's considering buying. So we'll start to stack our internal franchise experts, Brandy and Megan, whom you mentioned earlier, the CMO and uh, VP of digital at Franworth, are going to start leaning in uh, quite heavily on the franchise development aspect of those two newer brands, because we see a lot of opportunity to kind of beg, borrow, and lever some of the things we've done on Lash Lounge to gather more attention. And as those brands grow, not just in awarding, but obviously in opening, I think we're going to find a lot more synergies in the ways in which we approach marketing and potentially, Jamie, even with the partners that we work with. You know, we love to explore and make sure that we're kind of checking out different agencies and and different avenues. But there's also something to be said from a division standpoint uh, for me and the, the team to have a few very reliable partners who help us execute um, with excellence in marketing and social and pay-per-click. So I foresee, um, I foresee some shifting and some growing and, uh, and some real potential ahead for the Franworth Beauty Division. Yeah, that, that's, that's awesome. And I, I love how you talk about just the different life cycles of brands and, and where they are in their growth really kind of, dictates, you know, how many, how many staff that are going to have dedicated to them versus Absolutely. maybe shared resources. And, um, and I'm not, I'm not, I know, I know you, you know, as the sales guy here, Meg, you're trying to bait me <laughs> oh, into throwing comes. my name, my name in the hat, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep this about you. So, um, well, one, you've, one, got, one or two you've more got questions. Really, you've got audiences to get through, and you know who they are. You mentioned them all by name today, so you know we're, <laughs> we're always um, we're always I know, exploring. I know. But I think this is an important point, Jamie. Um, you know, obviously, you and I have worked together for over a decade now. I know what the capabilities sure. are of your agency and what the integrity is of the organizations you worked for and work with today. And if there are other marketers listening to this podcast, I would say. You know, you really want to make sure that you put together a proper RFP, a proper project scope, and that you explore that with a couple of different agencies. Because you and I both know um, there are bad actors in this industry and there are good actors, meaning not all agencies are created equal. And there's so many good ones, but you got to do your homework um, to be a good steward of those ad funds that are so precious to your franchisees. So of course I put Scorpion in that, um, in that good actor crew, but um, you know, want people to certainly do their homework. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I agree with you. So a couple, couple more, couple more points and questions. You talked about, um, you talked about some of the newer emerging brands that are part of the Franworth family. 
Um, but you actually do a lot for emerging brands outside of your day job. Yeah. Right? So you mentioned like the 90, <laughs> the 90 minutes that you, you know, you carve out to talk to new prospective franchisees and you don't know where you get the time. I don't know where you get the time to promote um, the, the, the other kind of outside your, your Fran worth responsibilities, but you do a lot to, to help promote, um, emerging brands in the franchise community. Tell me about how that got started and well, you know, what, <laughs> what drives your passion for that? Like a lot of things for me, it sort of gets started by accident. Um, you know, I get picked second a lot, which is okay. It's kind of my life story. Um, a couple years ago, IFA, <laughs> I think, I think my uh, buddy John we're, we're going to have a sidebar conversation yeah. about that. Well, get a load of so. this. So I think my buddy, John Tezza, and you know, John, um, he's the CEO John, yeah. of Hand and Stone. I think John at the very last second had to drop out of hosting the Emerging Franchise or Conference in New Orleans. And I think he'd been doing it for a number of years, like, you know, the Steve Martin of the Oscars. He's that big time. And he dropped out at the last second. And I think they called like 27 people that they knew. And then they ended up with me, which was like the Ellen DeGeneres, you know, a one and done type of thing. <laughs> um, so they, they called me to host it. And I went down there at the last second. I'd never been to their conference before. And I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved it. Kind of winged the whole thing because I wasn't even really sure why I was there. But I was so inspired by all of these you know, small franchisors, people who hadn't even written an FDD yet, who were investing their time and money to come and learn at the IFA. I thought, you know, these are really great people. They have found their way to a great resource. How can I be of assistance to them? So I was figuring I was going to get cut after that first one. And much to Teza's chagrin, I've just like bumped him out of that role. So I did it again last year in Nashville, and I'm doing it again uh, this year again, in New Orleans. And I wanted to figure out a way to kind of keep people engaged and give them free resources. So um, I'll probably always be a leader at this level because I'm always trying to give people stuff um, that they don't have to pay for. And I'm really focused on maintaining um, people's checkbooks so that they can grow um, in their own in their own company. So I'm like, all right, how many friends do I have? Maybe 10, maybe 15. Turns out I had a few more, including you. And I just came up with this dumb idea. It was kind of dumb at the time of finding 30 franchisors who clearly were at this conference who could benefit from having a mentor, just someone who's willing to chat with them once a month, give them some advice, give them some direction, help them avoid some of those mistakes that we've all made. So we started the 30 under 30 program with Thrive, um, a nice partner of ours at Franworth uh, several years ago, and they've continued to support me in this effort. We are through our second graduating class, and now we're on to our third assignment, um, where I'm going to be doing the matchmaking here shortly, um, which is always fun for me because I like to go in and figure out, you know, what I think people might have in common. And we're formalizing it a little bit this year. That that doesn't mean there's any fee. It's always going to be free. But helping the mentors have a little bit more of a rounded out schedule, a once per, once per month, couple of topics to cover. But it's been it's been really awesome, Jamie, to hear from these emerging franchisors the amount of guidance and advice and moral support and um, just education that's been provided by people like you, by, you know, Shane Evans, Sally Fascinelli, you know, you name it. Um, I just levered the the friends who've been kind enough to me in this industry to help others. So where do I find the time? I have no idea, but it just doesn't matter. You know, you, you make it work because it's going to help somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it just goes to show what an advocate uh, you are of, of franchising in general. And that's just one of the many ways that you demonstrate that. I have one more question around emerging franchises because okay. that's, I would say if there's, if there's one audience that, that, um, that we get a lot of interest, um, from at Scorpion, it is from emerging franchises. And I think it's because they're trying to, they realize probably through talking to people like you, the importance of, getting marketing right early on. Yeah. Because if you wait, if you wait and do it later, it's kind of hard to wrangle in. Yeah. So I want to just ask this is more of a tactical question, I guess, but if there were advice that you could give an emerging brand as it relates to their FDD and things that they may want to call out, like investments that they want to make sure that their franchisees are are officially carving out money for it could be, you know, technology fees for digital marketing infrastructure, like websites and things of that nature, or reputation management tools. It could be, you know, um, minimums that they're required to spend in local marketing of some yeah. sort. 
you know, know, knowing what you know today, if you were starting a brand, how would you think about some of the components of the FDD in order to set the franchisees up for success as you scale the business? That is such a great question. Um, gosh, if I could start an FDD from scratch, what would it look like? And this is where I think the, you know, the balance of what what you're going to award and sell has to be, it has to be responsible. It has to allow that potential future franchisee to make a living. You cannot burden the franchisee with every single fee that a franchisor should in some ways, not always, but should in some ways uh, be taking on as as the author of the brand, right? So we say when you're paying a royalty yeah. fee, you're getting access to the brand. You have the right to use the marks of the brand if you really want to boil it down. So that's a really important word. The franchisor should be making sure that the brand works, that the brand is connecting. And that means using those national ad fees to do things like you know, maintaining and building that core website, maintaining and building those core brand assets so that a franchisee can say and feel confident in the destination or the creation of the things they're going to put in the field. Having said that, I think you absolutely want to make sure um, that you have a national ad fund. I think that should be a fair percentage. It shouldn't be this egregious amount. We shouldn't be um, adding requirements beyond uh, the ad fee to try to boost the ad fee um, because that's almost always in the control of the franchisor as it should be. Franchisor needs to use those funds to invest in personnel and then maintain the brand. The franchisee themselves needs to have a minimum local marketing spend. What that should be is really up to each franchisor depending on the um, what the key investments are. I can't imagine a monthly spend in any brand across any industry that could be less than $1,500 a month because honestly, two-thirds of that is going to be gobbled up with your local digital presence. Then you've got a little bit left to spend on print perhaps. I am a believer that technology fees today are no longer just your point of sale system. I think historically, you know, an FDD from 10 years ago, we think tech fee is just my scheduling system. It's my operating software. But your operating software is bigger than that now. Your operating software is your reputation management. Your operating software is uh, perhaps a micro site fee to maintain and host that site within the franchise domain because things get so much more proliferated as a brand grows and as a franchisee's um, tentacles in in those areas grow as well. So I, I'm not a big person for nickel and diming and overfeeing uh, franchisees, but I think clarity is key. And I think um, that we want to make sure we have reasonable NAF, reasonable monthly that you're tracking, because it's one thing to say it, but if we aren't actually checking to see if people are spending <laughs> it, it may not be happening. And to put in a tech yeah, fee that allows yeah. for some growth and space. Yeah, I, I want to reemphasize that again, just being on, you know, on the on the supplier partner side with a lot of brands, I, I see a lot of that. It's in the FTD, you've got to do it, but there's not really eyeballs on making sure that it's being done. And um, I think that that's one of those things that if you're an emerging brand, you have the opportunity to really start that process and rigor early. It's easy to get in the habit of doing it earlier than having to, than having to wait until you have a bunch of franchisees who maybe aren't spending and you got to go reel that back in. Yeah, I mean, so I, I would say that the other part of that is if you're really good in franchising and you've gotten sophisticated or you're sophisticated right out of the gate, you should have a local marketing manager who is regularly checking in with the franchisees as to what their spend looks like within that 2000 a month, right? They should be getting a report from the national uh, pay-per-click agency that says, here's what's every what everyone's spending. And that marketing manager should know the delta between what's being spent and, and what might be spent in the three other areas they've recommended. So you've got to have that. But what you also need to have from day one, as important as a great FDD, is a great process for collecting the P&Ls. Don't be shy about that. Don't say, well, we'll do it next year. Do it right away. I'd say minimum once per year, but if you can, twice per year. And the reason for doing that is not because I'm trying to police the franchisees. The more data we get, the more we can compare the successful and the less successful franchisees and look at their 
PL comparison. And then you give that information back to the franchisees. You can say, hey, the franchisees in the top quartile are spending on average $2,500 per month in local marketing, and they're performing 30% better. Okay, that is inspiring to a franchisee to consider investing more versus being told to spend more. There's a big difference in how we can influence people's decisions versus insist on their actions. I love that. I love that. One more question, and I promise I'm going to let you go. Um, I'm going to put, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, make you think on your feet a little bit here. Though. Oh Lord. So you, you, you said, you've said before, um, and again, this is, I think I read, I read an article that you were interviewed in, or maybe it was a podcast, but I wrote it down. One of your favorite quotes was I did what I knew how to do. And when I knew better, I did better. Yeah. And that yeah, was by that Maya is, Angelou. That's Maya Angelou. Yeah. She's my favorite. Yeah. So tell me, tell me about a time in the last several years, because you made that jump from, you know, director of marketing, VP of marketing, CMO, um, into a president CEO role, you know, as it relates to that transition from marketing to chief executive officer, president, what was something that you, you quickly made, maybe you had made a mistake of, of doing as a CMO that through learnings in that transition, you learned, and then you were able to do better because of that learning. So I, I love that question, Jamie. Um, Maya Angelou's quote, I did then what I knew how to do. And when I knew better, I did better, um, is one of my favorites. I think the reason that I love it is it's about reflection. It's about recognizing um, that even when we think we're doing something great, there's always an opportunity to do it a little bit better. It's about transparency and, and authenticity and owning that, you know, none of us is, is perfect. Um, far from it, you know, we're all, we're all imperfect people. I think for me, um, the biggest reflection on that quote is the last couple of years with, um, my executive team, I maybe took for granted that communication is something, um, that I've often been told that I'm, I'm good at. And I think I, I think I took that for granted for a couple of years and didn't, communicate or make myself as available as I take such pride in believing is true, um, that I was, you know, focused on certain things and, and not, um, not listening as actively and not recognizing, um, the important shifts and changes that were, were needed and the accomplishments that were being delivered by an incredible executive team of, of people from the founder, Anna Phillips to Kristen Kidd, our VP and Noel, our director, Taylor, I mentioned, and, and Jill Biggs as well. These are all incredible talents. And for me, um, it was a moment of saying, Hey, look, guys, I haven't been I haven't been my best and I can, I can be better and you deserve better. So, um, you know, if you, if you can admit those things and you have a team that supports you that says, Hey, no big deal, you know, we're, we're here for all of it. Um, then you're in a good spot. Meg, I really appreciate the time today, especially in lieu of the fact that you're, you know, surrounded by, by nature's beauty. Um, so thanks for, thanks for carving out some time and having this conversation today. My pleasure. It was really great to, uh, to talk about some things I, haven't spoken about in a long time. So I appreciate you, Jamie. Appreciate the friendship. And uh, I'm looking forward to this podcast taking off. It'll be, this is your first episode. It's, this will be my first episode. I'm, I'm pretty yes. excited about it. So I feel yeah, so special. Right. Maybe I'll get, maybe I'll get asked back again one day. We'll see. So oh, you're thanks gonna, for having you're, me. You're I definitely going to do that. No, thanks, Meg. We'll talk soon. Have a soon. great week. You too. 